first. He's the uh, fish project manager for the Burns Paiute tribe. He said that he did have story maps ready to show us and really glad to see that. Chris. All right. So, yeah, my name's Chris Crowley. I'm the fisheries program manager at the Burns Paiute tribe. Thankful for the opportunity to, to get on this call and share some of the, the data visualization tools that we have developed and, and some of the story that went along with the uh, development of those. Really pleased with the, the work that's come out of this and I just wanted to let everybody know uh, as a caveat before I start this that I am, I am definitely a manager and not a techie. I have, I believe, Neil Ward from QW Consulting who, who actually developed a lot of these tools with us working with the tribe um, is on the line to, to answer questions that go beyond my expertise, but hopefully I can give you a little bit of a, a picture inside why we needed these kind of tools and, and how we use them on a day-to-day -day basis. So jumping right in, really this, this title slide, the two pictures that I have there, I, I felt were pretty representative of the, the things that, that we encounter that, that people want to get out of learning about our projects. You have two different groups that different people can represent both sides at any given time. There, there's the people that want to know about, you know, the the stunning landscape and, and why they should care about what we're doing and you know it's really developing that that heart connection with the science that's going on and then on the other side you definitely have the the group that really wants to dig into the, the technical information and wants to see charts and graphs and spreadsheets and i think that the the tools that we've been able to develop have really bridged the gap between those and are able to to satisfy the needs of, of those audiences on a, a broad scale, like really simultaneously. So jumping in, I just wanted to give a little bit of background. Traditionally, the, the tribe's natural resources department through the 90s and early 2000s, we, we had a pretty traditional method of, of data management, I would say. It was, it was beginning to get pretty dated um, by the time we got into the, the 2010 to where you know we would we'd go and we'd collect the data in the field we'd send the field crews out they would come back to the office and that would get entered into spreadsheets or databases and then stored on a server here at the tribe and really for for some uh, a variety of reasons this was not meeting the needs of what the tribe had for particularly data sharing and data security it was it was definitely a risk to have a lot of this uh, data stored in one place on the reservation. Um, it wasn't easily shared. It involved a lot of going through spreadsheets and databases to pull and query information so that you could actually put it in a way that was meaningful to an audience. And that was problematic for us because we use the data that we collect for everything from the development of reports to presenting at technical work groups to updating tribal leadership and, and potential funders and, and conducting public outreach for our project. And then um, the big one that I put on there is preserving institutional knowledge. And I think that a lot of folks can probably relate to how difficult it is when you have staff turnover or turnover in a, a working group, a technical working group for to get somebody up to speed. And so digging through in the time that it takes to go through data in those ways really wasn't meeting the need of the tribe. And then to I guess compound that issue a little bit. Um, in, in 2014, we actually had a, a structure fire of our entire um, IT building here on the on the reservation, and this caused some some massive uh, data loss. Um, we we did have a decent amount backed up, but there was also a lot of stuff that was just lost. And and this is like I, I can put a, a fire extinguisher on fire here as a little bit of a joke now, but. It's seriously taken all of four years to be able to joke about this at all because it was a it was a it was a big deal. Um, a lot of the the stuff. I mean, it was a, it was a huge setback for the tribe, and we were left with this mostly. Um, we had hard copies of our data all stored in separate places. Um, some of it was available electronically that that was on servers that had been backed up in a different location, but the vast majority of it um, was just in, in binders and boxes on shelves and file cabinets. And so that's where we, uh, with some of the insurance money that, that came from the fire, we were able to really jumpstart our upgrade of our data management system to something that was going to be more useful for us going into the future. And so we 
contacted QW Consulting to talk about what our options might be for getting, first first things first, getting this data in a place where it was going to be secure and backed up and a place where we could avoid having the same thing happen again. But then also, I mean, in the 21st century, we want our data to be as usable and user-friendly as possible, and we want it to be shareable and accessible quickly. And so we worked with them. They worked with both our fisheries and our wildlife department to develop some tools that were able to meet all of those goals that, that we outlined. And so after this is this is what we have and these are some of the the mapping story maps that i want to take you through that we uh, have found very useful here at the tribe and and each one of them the fisheries and the wildlife are are quite different in in the practicality and the approach that they took so i want to pull that up for you here so the the first three maps that i have are the fisheries maps that we came up with and these they deviate a little bit from uh, some of the other story maps that you may have seen, and that they they just contain a lot of data, and they're very customized and and searchable to tell a story. And so this first one that I've pulled up is our water quality data, and and you can see we we just did a snapshot year year of, of of 2015, and these are in the the Malheur River Basin and the Upper Malheur here, and then in the North Fork over here. These are these are just thermograph locations, and we're specifically looking at all these metrics as they relate to bull trout recovery, which is where our program spends the majority of its time. And so we've got this legend down in the left corner that just talks about the amount of days that that stream recorded temperatures that were above the lethal threshold for bull trout. And so we're able to really quickly visualize where the suitable habitat within the basin is, where we would expect to see uh, high numbers of, of bull trout, um, especially migratory corridors and things like that. You can see these the, the white circles represented that it never it never got above those temperatures. And then on the, on the color scale, from yellow being one to nine days, uh, orange 10 to 19, and red over 20 days. So we can see where the temperature uh, potential barriers are to bull trout use and migration really quickly. And then I don't have a whole lot of time for these presentations, so I'm going to give kind of the, the quick flyover. These are all available at, at dptdnr.com, and I encourage you to go on there and, and play around with it a little bit and, and see some of the different things that these can do. But I'm going to move on to this is uh, this is bull trout telemetry, um, and the tribe did a lot of telemetry work from 1999 to 2005 in both the, the Upper Malheur Basin and the the North Fork, and so. You, you see that you, you pull up this map with everything and it gets confusing really fast, but you're able to parse things down quickly if we just want to look at year 1999. There we go. And even then, we can, we can go into looking at a, a specific fish and we can see um, the colors are by, by time of year. So we can see like when this fish was captured in the spring, um, it hung out for a little bit, and then throughout the summer, it migrated pretty quickly, spent a lot of its time up in these headwater reaches where it spawns in September and October before heading back down to um, Eula Reservoir for the winter. Um, so we're able to click on that, and then we can click on a specific point and, and learn everything about the fish. We can see when it was first collected, how big it was, um, the maximum distance it traveled from where it was collected. Um, and whether it lived through the life of the study. And so the next mapper that we have um, is largely represents a lot of the bull, bull trout work and specifically brook trout removal work that we've done. And, and I, I honed in on Lake Creek right here, which is kind of a pilot study area that is, is one of the things that we base a lot of our presentations to the public and council on. It's, it's kind of the direction that our program is going right now is this pilot study that we did from 2012 to 2017 on trying to remove brook trout mechanically from this stream. And so here we're able to select which fish we want to look at, bull trout, brook trout. Um, we can look at both. We can look at all of them with, with hybrids. For here, we'll just go bull trout and brook trout. And Lake Creek Falls is a barrier that is impassable by 
by fish, but the brook trout have been stocked above, so we, we see only brook trout above that barrier. So for some comparison information, we can look below that, and we can see 98.4% of the captures were brook trout com compared to just over 1% bull trout. And from there, we can click more details and get into a lot more of the weeds of the data. We can look at uh, trends by year of what we were able to capture in there. It, we can break down length frequency to look at the size of bull trout versus brook trout. Um, length weight regression, we can overlap it with red data that's been collected in the basin. And so there's, there's a lot of really um, a powerful stuff here that is is available to to quickly pull up and show and i think satisfy an audience whether they're looking to get into the weeds technically or they, they're looking for that big picture thing um, and then i also wanted to talk a little bit about a uh, the product that our wildlife department came up with which is a little bit more of a traditional story map and and they wanted this is much more project specific rather than the spanning you know the the entire work for a species that they're doing. Um, this this focused on specifically a mule deer collaring project. Our, our wildlife program manager, I told her I was going to present on this this morning, and she, she mentioned that this was the tug at your heartstrings story mapper. And so there's a there's a 10 mile stretch basically uh, along um, one of the tribe's properties that's a winter corridor for, for mule deer. And it, it actually represents about 6% of the total mule deer vehicle collisions in the entire state on that 10 miles of highway right there. And so this, this kind of takes you through a little bit of the work that we've done as far as collaring mule deer and trying to hone in what their range is and looking at um, potential places that we can improve road crossings and fencing structures to reduce that loss, which the, the cost analysis is, is something crazy like $1.5 million a year that, of, of damage that's, uh, that's done in this stretch so we, we've got several different maps here that i mean the user can interact with as much as they want along with the pictures and kind of reading the overview if they want more information they're able to to click in and see in this one mile stretch between 2010 and 2016 we had 62 collisions um and if we if we keep scrolling through and and get you know from the mule deer collaring exercise we get into other maps that show um, specifically where they were collared um, that that goes into coming up with maps about their entire range the, at least the the collared range that we had um, moves into um, maps about uh, where the the highest road crossings uh, occurred during our collaring study. And so all this is really able to be used to tell the story, whether it's to potential funders, whether it's to uh, tribal council to uh, brief them on the direction that the program wants to go. All in all, I think really powerful tools that we're, we're really excited to have at our fingertips. Again, I, I know I don't have a whole lot of time to, to continue to go through this, but um, I encourage you guys to visit the website and spend some time checking this out and playing around on it and feel free to email me with any questions. So at the end of the day, um, I know that, that we talked to uh, Sharon asked specifically to, to talk about the audiences that these are geared towards, which I think it, it has the tools to, to work in just about any situation. Um, it's, it, it took about 180 hours uh, for QW's time to develop the mule deer mapper. Um, the bull trout mappers, which are a lot more detailed and contain a lot more data, took about 436 hours. Um, and that's, that's not including the data entry that we needed um, post IT fire. Um, but basically the bull trout mappers are supported by a Microsoft Access database that um, we have a staff here and are able to, to update. Um, we're in the process of getting that updated through 2018 now. and um, we're able to, to basically send that back to them and have them link it and update the, uh, the mappers that way. Um, at the end of the day, I, I feel that our, our data management needs are met. Um, our data is much more secure because it's on the internet, which is a lot harder to burn down than our IT building. Um, it's, it's shareable. We can, I mean, it's as simple as sending somebody a link and, and maybe giving them a little bit of direction on, on where to go and what to look for. 
Um, it's something that we can easily pull up in meetings to, to go through or, or bring people quickly up to speed that are new onto um, some of the collaborative projects that we have. And so I think that's about the, the time that I have for you guys this morning. I'm, I'm happy to, I don't know how we're doing questions, Sharon, if we want to wait till the end or um, please write down my email and, and send me any questions you might have as well as you're um, playing around with these. This is great, Chris. Thank you. I think we have time for a couple questions. All right. And we may have more questions, maybe comparison questions at the end of all the presentations. Next we have Erin Butts. Erin, are you on the line? Ready with your Yep, I'm still here. That's great. So Erin is a GIS specialist. She contracts for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And she works with Lamprey at the moment. She does some other work with GIS land ecology mapping. Now she's showing us also story maps um, having to do with lamprey. So thanks, Erin. So yeah, like Sharon said, um, my name is Erin Butts and I work as a GIS specialist on contract with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, I spend most of my time at the Columbia River Fish and Wildlife Conservation Office working on Pacific lamprey data. So I'm going to go over uh, the story map I made. It's been used by the Pacific Lamprey Conservation Initiative and can be found on their homepage. First, I'll kind of go over uh, why we needed it and why we chose to use story maps to visualize the data and then walk through the features of the story map before going over some of the lessons learned and our future goals moving forward. Um, the Pacific Lamprey Conservation Initiative has this website which has a lot of awesome information uh, it's got links to different documents, but they're kind of in a lot of different places and not necessarily um, the easiest for people who aren't familiar with Lamprey or the initiative um, to like find what they're looking for. We also have Data Clearinghouse housed on ScienceBase, um, which also has a bunch of information and like great resources. However, they're mostly used by people who know about Pacific Lamprey and are already highly involved. Those that are also that are, are involved also reach out to me for updated data, questions about static maps, how to download data, um, and things like that. Um, those reasons, along with some of the goals of the initiative, which are outreach, increasing awareness, both of what Pacific Lamprey are and why they're important, as well as the resources available are why we turn to uh, Esri Story Maps. So as you saw from the first presentation, you can do a lot of things with story maps, and ours more, um, is more of the like traditional story map. So you can use them to tell the story. You can include interactive maps. They're really easy to share. You can embed multimedia resources, and they help achieve all of our goals. So, And sometimes they're kind of fun, too. So that's what we decided to do. On this, this is one of the static maps just showing the Pacific Land Prairie distribution. As you can see, it's not necessarily the most helpful for people who are really curious about, say, the Oregon coast. You can't really see what streams there are. And in order for this to be more useful, I created interactive maps. We have some housed on databases. However, some people still had some issues using those. So to make them even more user-friendly, I created some interactive maps in ArcGIS Online, which were incorporated into our story maps. A little bit about our audience. We have a very broad audience for the story map. Throughout discussions, we wanted a way for partners to see the data and access resources that was easy and straightforward. We also wanted scientists and people who work on restoration and streams that don't necessarily know about lamprey to learn about them and to educate the public about this native species because a lot of people don't know that they exist, and if they do know about lamprey, they don't know that they're that the Pacific lamprey are native here. So instead of making multiple story maps, I created the story map in a way or, that users could either scroll through and kind of gain some basic information, or if a partner knew exactly what they want, they can skip to their section of interest, or if people want to learn as much as they can, there are lots of embedded actions and media for users to dig in as much as they want to. On this, you can also see a screenshot of one of our the Twitter posts that kind of helped get the story map out to the public. And with that, let me pull over the story map. So I developed the story map with help from the Lamprey team in my office, as well as with input from tribal partners and um, feedback from our conservation team. And 
there are many different templates for story maps and we use the journal style. So as you scroll through, you kind of learn more and more information. It starts with this table of contents, which are all links to the pages and you can jump to them. Um, I'm just gonna kind of scroll through and give a little tour of what we've done and kind of some of the um, functionality I've included. So with a scroll through, you can kind of gain some quick information on like what lamprey are, their habitat and range. And we had a lot of information to include. So I kind of split up the text with headers and images where I could. And throughout, there are uh, little things you can click and links to kind of dig into the information. And as you keep going, we've got like why lamprey are important, some graphics and images, and there's this embedded uh, YouTube video. And I really liked the ability to embed like YouTube videos and you can embed some websites easily because it keeps users on the story map, but they can still access these other resources, which is really, I think a really cool ability of story maps. So as you keep scrolling, kind of getting more and more information, you can read a lot of details about what we've, like uh, these are threats to Lamprey, uh, or you can just look at the pictures, kind of whatever user the user wants to do. And then this is the first of three interactive maps that are included in the story. Um, this map shows the distribution data for the database I manage. Um, there's a separate one for California that we want to um, incorporate into this, but it also shows our regional management units. And for users who work in specific management units, they're the ones that have the data shown are listed here. You can click on them and it will zoom in and show you um, more information. The barriers will pop up. Uh, this is a really good way for us to include barriers, which people ask about a lot when they see maps, and we knew that they wanted to see them, but it, it helps to keep the main, main map simple and uncluttered when they just show up when you zoom in. And you can interact with the map, you can see the streams, what the stream name is, when it was seen and what project uh, or group was doing the surveys. And then you can go back and dams go away and it's back to the beginning. Um, since California hasn't been in included in this map yet, I actually embedded the website where it is hosted with the California um, BIOS page. And you can interact with their interactive map through this embedded website which is a really cool way to include it until um, I can go through and make sh and add it to ours. And you can also click and see the streams and the data, and their data is available to download as well. Um, this next map, so this shows our NatureServe risk assessment scores for watersheds that have been assessed. We actually have a new assessment in the process of being released. So these scores are from our 2011 assessment. But um, users can click and you can see the watershed and what it ranked out for its uh, risks. Um, this is gonna be, like I said, this will be updated. And this map is really helpful to show to like higher level policy group members and partners so that they can kind of gain some higher level information without having to get too into the weeds of all of the distribution data. This next map, uh, showcases work done by the conservation initiative or work that maybe is done in the area that may benefit Lamprey. In the last year or so, we've had a lot more projects and um, more funding opportunities, so I do have a lot to add. But for now, this shows like work that's being done in the area. You can click, it'll tell what action or what it was. In this case, there was a dam removed and there's a photo of a Pacific Lamprey that was found above the former dam site. So this is also useful for policy partners or for anyone who's just curious on what work the conservation initiative is doing and where and how um, there's been progress made with the initiative. And as I said, there's we had a lot of information, so it's kind of all included and you can get kind of in, as deep as you want to. And then this is uh, 
the National Fish Habitat Partnership map. And this kind of uh, is a good example of, I tried embedding this website, however, it didn't really work very nicely. Um, so that sometimes happened throughout the story map creation process where things didn't work how I wanted. Um, and it requires you to get a little bit creative um, and be a little bit flexible on how to display things. And then finally, I've got links at the end to all the resources used in creating the story map and ex additional resources, links back to the clearinghouse and the web page that I showed in the um, slideshow, and links to download all the data seen in the map. I was really lucky, a lot of the, all these resources existed um, when I was putting together the story map. And then if I go back here, so some lessons learned. Uh, I would say first, look at the existing story maps for ideas and inspiration. As you can see from my story map and the, um, the previous story maps, there are a lot of different ways to do it. Um, this story map really closely followed the layout for the California condor story map, which is another Fish and Wildlife Service story. And it's a really good way to see the different templates and potential functionality that's available. Um, for us, since we had a large area with a lot of data, we were striving for simple maps to tell the stories. All three of our maps are fairly simple and allow users to understand a different piece of the lamprey story and also made interacting with the maps a lot easier for non-GIS folks. Um, I'd say be careful with photo links. I originally used a lot of Facebook photos from our Luna the Lamprey output, Outreach Facebook page, um, but then they were no longer compatible and I lost all my photo links and had to go back and replace them all. Uh, Flickr has worked really well, so hopefully that will stay compatible and um, you can also save photos to your AGOL account to use those. And then depending on your organization's rules, you may have to pay attention to like the security and HTTP versus HTTPS, which I know I have to change over some of mine. Um, so keeping on top of like changes uh, has been um, something we've had to do. And then Stripe maps have increased in a lot of functionality. For example, I originally had to code those uh, the table of contents where you jump to the different pages and it's now a built-in tool. And I'm not a big coder, but the story maps are open source. And so if you know how to code, you can customize the apps and appearances, as well as the web links and usage reports, which um, are very useful. And just the uh, included usage report, just for our story map for the last year, I included just show. So you can see when our story map was released at the end of November last year and it coincided with a really big lamprey event, so we had a ton of views. And um, that was released with lots of different social media posts. And the, um, some of the spikes actually correspond to our Lamprey Conservation Initiative meetings. So as when we remind people of the story map, they go and look at it more. Um, so that's kind of cool to see. Then our next steps moving forward are uh, just keep updating the map. Like I said, we've got a lot more projects that have been done in the last year or so that need to be added. Um, integrate the California distribution data into our map. And we're going to try and get Alaska data included too to cover the whole range in the US. And then we're excited about um, this next step of we're going to try and develop a way for users to submit their data. Um, I've been trying, I've been starting to use Esri's survey one, two, three, um, potentially in uh, combination with Collector, so that the data can just be submitted by users out in the field and it would automatically go online into an interactive map so everyone working on Lamprey can see it and it can more easily be added to our database. I'm working on this now and so this is a screenshot showing kind of my first go at creating the surveys. And yeah, I know a lot of people in the office have shared our story map with others, so I know it's reaching a lot of users. Uh, people share it with their family members just to show kind of a fish that we work on or as outreach. And I know it's used a lot in, uh, in as an in information source during meetings with others. So overall, we've found uh, the story map to be a fun and effective way to share our data with others.
Thanks, Erin. Nice presentation. I have a quick comment. This is Nancy from the council. Yes, hi, Nancy. Oh, hi. I was just hoping that uh, the presenter would be willing to come back and share with us how that survey one, two, three, and collector works out for her, because that's something I've been interested in learning more about, too, but I haven't had the time to or the opportunity to explore it yet. Yeah, as soon as I figure it all out, I would be happy to. Terrific. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, Erin, do you have a timeline for releasing that to your field tech? Not yet. I know I'm going to uh, do a quick speed talk on it in December at our uh, Lamprey uh, information exchange meeting, but I think I don't think it will be out by then either. I think that's just kind of to share with people that it will be coming. I don't think right. we have a set date yet because I'm still trying to learn it. Right. Do you plan to release it as a pilot? Yeah, I think we we want to do a pilot and get some feedback from people on like what works and what doesn't for the questions and things. Yeah, that process would be interesting too, but especially interesting how you plan to integrate it with your story map on the fly in real time. Sounds yeah, I got to figure that all out. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. So yeah, we'll thank you. you back. When <laughs> I have a question for Chris. Oh, Chris, um, I saw in your presentation that you are feeding in your data from an access database. Could you talk a little yeah. bit more about that and how yeah, often you're updating? And if, if Neil is, is still on the phone, he might be able to, to answer more about the process. Um, we, we, so we currently still just have the, the 2015, up to 2015 data in there. We're updating that this winter for the last three years. Um, and I think after that, it'll, it'll be a yearly process. I, I, it sounds like it's a pretty um, simple thing of just getting it entered into access and then um, relinking the database to the mapper. Oh, so it's, um you enter update at an interval rather than a live feed right okay cool Thanks. all right evan are you out there and yes I see all right evan. so evan brown is with the idaho department of fish and game and he is the senior data manager and data steward yeah. and he's showing us a new website which is a work in progress and thank you oh. for being here evan thanks sharon my name is evan brown and i'm gonna do sort of a talk a presentation from a different perspective this is an older website which um, we are we want to update with new technologies and automate the data flow as much as possible and generally speaking it's a lot of data uh, because we're dealing with numerous species and we're dealing with numerous life stages and we try to supply data uh, for all those species, all those life stages. So, all right. Anybody else have questions for Aaron or Chris? So, Chris, this is Tom Iverson. Hey, so did you build a data management system for all your field data now, uh, like a structured system that automatically feeds your website? So we don't have it automatically feeding the website, but we do have cloud storage so that it's not like it's gonna unless the internet burns down. We should be good. <laughs> but did you shift from individual project leaders managing their data to one common data system for all your biologists? We, we It's still pretty uh, program specific, um, but we do have one manager in our IT department that um, puts it all where it's supposed to go. Again, I'm not too up to speed on, on how it all works as far as the um, backing everything up. Uh, but I just know that it's it's there and it, it is <laughs> now. It's better than it was, right? Right, right. I run into problems when I try to go into uh, slideshow mode, so um, I'm going to try to avoid that. And first and foremost, um, I'd like to pick up where I left off and just give credit to uh, Fish Passage Center. Uh, we collaborated, IDFG collaborated with them on this website, and they're hosting it and they created it and we just merely supplied data to it and they supplied data to it. So um, to hit the topics real quick, um, it's a technical website meant to provide data to biologists, uh, researchers, managers, et cetera, what we affectionately call fish heads. It is not tiered, uh, it is the technical data and 
That's because we have coordinated assessments and StreamNet websites to take care of those other needs. Uh, with that said, there are tons and tons of data there uh, that closely mirror what we have on coordinated assessments and StreamNet, but this is just Idaho specific. Now, the website itself, if I could go to that, let's see. Bam. It's quite complex. Um, this is the initial screen, and the first thing that you notice is that it's not going to be mobile friendly uh, past a certain point. So you've got this table of contents over here on the left, and then you've got click here to open the IDFG portal. And it immediately throws you into a map where you can choose a species and then show its geographic extent. With that said, if you go over here and you choose one of these links to the life cycle navigator, that's when you start bringing up all the data. And so you're already three or four clicks in, and so that's something that we'd like to simplify. In addition to that, it would make it a lot more functional on mobile devices. <clears throat> the salmon life cycle, in case you don't know, it makes a lot of sense to biologists, but nine out of 10 other people just looked at us like we were crazy. Uh, <laughs> we chose this species and run a geographic area, and I always start up here um, with the juveniles. You and you can't even tell that there's data behind this, but we'll work on that. You can see that there's juvenile abundance and juvenile survival to lower granite. We supply the juvenile abundance estimates. Fish Passive Center supplies the juvenile survival to granite. Uh, hatchery production, the whole works. You can see you just sort of keep going from life stage to life stage. Juvenile tributary data to juvenile main stem. That's the smolt monitoring data. That's where the Fish Passage Center comes in. Now, and you keep on going around the horn and you get the dam counts, you get harvest, SARs. So if you figure that you're doing this for Chinook, Steelhead, Sockeye, and eventually uh, Coho, and we also have some data on lamprey, and then you also wanna break it up by population, you can see that you're going to have a lot of data. And that's why we called it fishing for big data. With that said, we need to automate as much of the data flow as possible. And that was one of our key issues. And that brings me to the next step. So we have adult abundance data over lower granite. That's some of the adult data. And then we have the uh, SARs for both hatchery and wild Chinook. That's fish passage center data, lower granite dam, dam counts, et cetera. And so it's a very complex website and you can see that folks could rapidly get lost. And so we need to figure out a way to make the choices and the navigation of the site to the data that they're looking for easier. So that brings me to my next point. <clears throat> right now you have adults to juveniles to adults, and then it just keeps on going and going and going. And right now we have static updates where we just grab the most current year's data, put it into a template, send it to Fish Passage Center. I'd like to replace those with a API on our end so that we can just grab the data out of our enterprise databases in a view and send that to them, and they can populate the website with it. With that said, Fish Passage Center is already there, and they have these dynamic queries that they can run whenever we want to see SARs or dam counts. We can download, once you do find data, you can download the data to a CSV, and you can download the charts and the maps to PNGs. So lessons learned. Um, so far, at this point in the process, like I said, I'm just getting into this. And first order of business is to get the data up to date with the existing website and data flow. But 
what I've learned so far is that we really need to manage our websites and our information tools, just like our databases and our other applications. They have a finite life cycle. And this one is what, about 10 years old and you know, it's starting to show its age. And so we need to keep up with technology and we also need to keep up with the data flow, the volume and the speed. Oh, and one other thing, uh, there is pretty decent metadata associated with the data downloads. I like that. I'm going to enhance that. And we, I think we need to do a better job of clearly documenting the data sources, you know, giving credit where credit is due, because this is a huge collaborative effort and there are data coming from many different sources. So those are some of the issues and the potential solutions that we've talked about so far. And like I said, uh, we're going to need, we have quite a bit of experience with the APIs and the web services. So I wouldn't anticipate more than one to two weeks of creating, testing, and throwing those into production for most of these data sources. Um, let's see. Other than that, I think that's about it. I think I hit all the main topics that I could, and it looks like I have one minute left. So does anybody have any questions or suggestions or alternative solutions to what I already mentioned? All right. This is this is Nancy from the council. Hey, Nancy. Hi. Uh, we are actually struggling with something similar. It's not as detailed as your data set, but if you recall a while back, the managers had created a status as a resource, uh, which manually compiled information from you know papers, documents, Excel spreadsheet all over the place, coordinate assessment stream that as well. <clears throat> and we're currently right now trying to figure out also how can we make all that data digestible by someone that's not technical. And we're, we're, we basically have decided that we're gonna leave our detail underlying structure in place, you know, tweak it, refine it a bit, reorganize it a bit, but we're gonna uh, overlay it with more of an infographic layer so that when the public comes, that's the part that they get to explore more and they, you know, learn about story maps, infographics versions that's built from the underlying database. And then only the technical people uh, would be diving in deeper. But I'll let you know how it goes. We have we're just in the process of trying it out. So if it looks cool. like a, it works well, we'll let you know. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so far, uh, I have been so focused on uh, helping develop the SQL databases and the mobile apps in order to get the data in there and keep them flowing and then developing the views and sharing the views that uh, I, I haven't even gotten into the story maps. Uh, we're just now getting into ArcGIS 10.6 and expanding our ArcGIS online. Uh, I look forward to doing that. Lord knows I have a lot of ideas for story maps that would be really cool, but uh, I'm, I'm, just a total data geek. So I, I usually leave the, yeah, the fancy maps and so on to other folks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, oh. I like to get the data to people in their conferences and their meetings on their phones so that they can answer those questions as soon as they need it. So, yeah. Uh, I know we, we keep uh, looking at that too, because we need people like you guys so that we can stop having to enter all the data manually too. So <laughs> indeed. Yeah. It's a good and collaborative effort. Yeah. Yeah. My whole, uh, my whole mantra is uh, compile once in a complete correct data source and publish a thousand times. And I mean, mm -hmm. you're, yeah, you're definitely one of our big customers. So. Thanks. All right. Anything else? Anybody? All righty, woo, 1202. <laughs> <laughs> 1202, 11.02 Pacific time. We have a, a, a good 20 minutes. We can keep talking and discussing, and thanks, Evan. And maybe you can confer a little bit with Chris 
and Erin about Story Maps. I know it's almost like having two different roles, data manager and then presentation of data, but hopefully maybe others in the group can help you out. And yeah, and um, yeah, I'd also like to talk to uh, Chris about the uh, brook trout and bull trout work that they're doing, and also Erin about her survey one, two, three and data collection in the field. So does anyone else have any more comments or? Yeah, hey Sharon, this is Evan. And uh, I was talking about that with uh, Chris Harrington, one of our programmers, mm -hmm. and also uh, some other folks in the GIS shop. And yeah, I, I'd go ahead and offer myself as a point of contact to, you know, if people do have more technical questions about the API development or mobile apps in the field, feel free to uh, shoot me an email and I'll put you in touch with the experts, the technical experts. That sounds and good. also I'd like to second Nancy's uh, proposal to Erin that she come back and present, you know, her findings as far as survey one, two, three. Sounds good. We will. Okay. Sounds good. In that same vein, I, I've told everyone about CDI, the Community for Data Integration. They're also a great resource that has a lot of information. They're run by USGS, but anyone can take advantage of what they have. CDI has monthly meetings in many subgroup uh, working groups that meet. So you can take advantage of those. You can take advantage of the webinars that they post. I think right now they want to get a uh, Python group going so people can learn Python. So there's a lot going on with CDI, and I highly recommend that you see what they're doing and take advantage of their seminars. So this is CDI. So through 2018, we started in March. We had eight meetings. We had 12 presentations. I wonder, Sharon, this is Nancy again, Hi, Nancy. if uh, when we take a look at all the presentations that happen at Offwin, if there's topics that were presented by presenters from outside the basin that look of interest to the group, maybe we could invite them to give us a more in-depth presentation. I think that's true. I was planning to mine them, <laughs> take oh, good. a look Perfect. at who, who <laughs> focus actually on data visualization. We already had a presentation from John Watson who also works for ICF. That was last month. I was thinking also the Tableau one, uh, how was it Missouri that was using Tableau to organize their data and to display it, something like that. Right, Joe Kirby. And Joe Kirby gave us a presentation in October uh, okay. also. So, I'll so right, so those, yeah, the last two people that presented in October, they were from the OFM conference. Oh, good, thanks. Any other comments? Thank you all.